Well, good morning, everybody. On behalf of <clears throat> Judge Reardon and Sawyer, I want to welcome you to this session of the Court of Appeals. And as you can see, we are privileged to have with us a Judge Sawyer who retired about a year and a half ago, but was kind enough to come back to the call of duty. Uh, we, Judge Servito, has been ill and has now re uh, announced her retirement. And so we needed someone to help fill in for our panels and uh, he was kind enough to do that for not only this panel, uh, but next month as well. So always good to have Judge Sawyer back. Um, with that, we'll jump into the cases. Item number eight, docket number 361969, People versus Elliot. I should have added that uh, I don't know if they're happy or not. <laughs> oh, they'll love the opinions, no matter what. <laughs> Please the court, the entire court. Jonathan Simon uh, on behalf of Mr. Elliott. This was a retrial after Mr. Elliott's first conviction was overturned. Um, following trial in uh, this matter, um, the jury was pared down to 12 members for deliberation. And during that deliberation, one of the jurors announced that the stress was too much for her unborn child and asked to be excused. The court granted that and um, but instead of bringing back in one of the other jurors who were an alternate, uh, the judge apparently did not want to unduly delay the proceedings and neither did the prosecutor or defense counsel who all agreed to go with a 12, 11 person jury. The problem is nobody appeared to have asked or received the consent of Mr. Elliott. The de defendant was in the courtroom when this was done, correct? Yes. Okay, but there was no direct confrontation to him by the court. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And but and he acquiesced to it by being there, did he not? No, I don't believe. I understand so. the court rule says they've got to ask him. You got to deal with that. And, and and the case law too that the, the jury trial is a significant constitutional right, which counsel cannot waive huh. on his behalf. You know, this kind of looks like an appellate parachute, though. Too. I mean, here he is. The judge should have gone directly to the individual. His counsel's there. The, uh, the plaintiff's there. Everybody agrees. He watches it, listens to it, and doesn't say a word. So if the verdict comes back not guilty, he's fine. If it comes back guilty, he's got the appellate parachute. He's got his, his issue. Well, sir, I think you're giving Mr. Elliott too much credit. We don't know that he has the, uh, that he understands that he has that right. We don't know that he has an, uh, an opportunity to uh, assert his opinion. Nobody asked him. He's sitting there when the lawyer is saying, yeah, we can do this. No problem. Let's just move on. And I, and I don't think that that satisfies the Constitution and his right to a trial by 12 members. Also argue it would be ineffective assistance of counsel. Yes. Um, well, there, that is argument too. And, and counsel, it's a separate issue. It doesn't um, actually involve the, the jury question. It involves the uh, preparation uh, of, of trial counsel who acknowledged that he'd failed to review Mr. Elliott's video before having Mr. Elliott testify. And counsel elicited from Mr. Elliott facts which completely contradicted his uh, videotape statement. The defendant knew the, uh, that he was videotaped, didn't he? Well, and he didn't tell counsel. Well, I, I don't know that, you know, you go into a room I mean, at the DDC you and you think that if you're videotaped to interview that, yeah, I was interviewed, counsel, they interviewed me. He never told them. Well, I don't know. It's not like they have a, a, a cameraman sitting in the DDC in the interrogation room. There are hidden cameras. Uh, sometimes I even I was interviewed. You know, this is not the first lawyer who represented Mr. 
Elliot in this matter. Um, new counsel was applied uh, following the, uh, the prior to the retrial. Um, I don't know whether initial counsel discussed this with Mr. Elliot or whether initial counsel provided a copy of the uh, video to Mr. Elliot. We do know that substitute counsel who presided over the second trial did not do so. We know this because he said that on the record. I didn't have it. I didn't see it. I didn't know about it. And that's why I asked him these questions, which completely contradicted that testimony, uh, that not testimony, but the statement, and which I think so seriously prejudiced Mr. Elliot, uh, uh, because then he was impeached by all of this video, uh, which completely contradicted his trial testimony and, and really undercut his entire defense. We believe that, um, that this was a big mistake and that, uh, but for this mistake, the result may have been different. We don't have to show, I think that it would have been different, only that there's a reasonable possibility. And, and I think that is evident. And, and so for that reason too, we believe that Mr. Um, Mr. Elliott should uh, enjoy a new trial. There are two other issues, uh, one involving the due diligence. That's a closer question. And I, I think sentencing a 19 year old to natural life imprisonment, well, that's been decided, but um, it, it has to be preserved because I, I think the law is clear and well, not necessarily the law, but the science is clear that brains don't fully develop until one reaches approximately the age of 25. And so I think that that may be something that should also be revisited, but I do understand that uh, this court may be somewhat limited in arriving at any conclusions with respect to that. I heard it was age 27. I'd read someplace it was age 27. Well, so there's kind of a lot of uh, right. And, and, and I think that I don't know. First, they cut it at 17. Now they're saying 18. I think maybe 19, 20, even 25 may be the last, next logical step. <clears throat> and so acknowledging prior case law, I've raised that issue as well. Kind of like the camel with the nose under the tent. Um, I believe so. I, I think that uh, and I was at one of the very first Miller hearings back in the um, maybe more than 10, 15 years ago. I'm losing track these days, but uh, uh, it, it is broadening and I think it should be greater than it is right now. Some do, some don't, <laughs> but the law doesn't support the position right now. That's I, I understand that, but and I, I, I the strongly- Supreme Court hasn't gone, they're not gonna go past 21. They've already denied leave in a case where, where our court said it doesn't, you know, 21 years old is, I understand, but oh. Mr. Uh, Elliotus was 19, so perhaps there's some hope there. Um, all right, anything else? No, thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you, you for your arguments. Case is submitted. <clears throat> Item number nine, which is consol two consolidated cases. Document number 367264, People versus Crump, and 367265, People versus. Willis. Okay. Oh, that's right. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, my name is Joseph Schaap. I'm appearing on behalf of the appellant, the people in both consolidated cases. Uh, my P number is 81256. Um, I, in reviewing this case the last couple of days, it seems pretty clear to me it's a relatively simple issue. Um, I think the briefs kind of lay everything out. Uh, just very briefly, my position, of course, is that with regard to Mr. Crump, the proposed 404B evidence is relevant to prove his common scheme and his motive. And for Ms. Willis, uh, it is uh, relevant to prove her knowledge and her intent. Um, and just I want to briefly touch on one thing each defendant said in their appellate briefs that I didn't get a chance to reply to. Um, with regard to Mr. Crump, he had argued that a case called People versus Felton had basically precluded our theory of relevance. And I think Felton is distinguishable for a couple of reasons. Um, first, uh, unlike in Felton here, we have one consistent driver for the multiple crimes. I believe in Felton, the only uh, common feature was that the def defendant in question was a passenger in a car, but there were other drivers. There was not a consistent uh, pairing of co-conspirators so I think that's distinguishable. Uh, also, uh, I think the court in Felton made quite a bit of uh, 
out of the fact that the prosecutor had actually made a propensity argument to the jury. Obviously, we would not do so here because that is pre pre precluded by uh, 404B. And then also, I believe uh, the car here is also is the same car in both crimes, unlike in Felton, where I believe it was different cars over the over the course of the 404B evidence and then the instant offense. Um, and then turning to Miss Willis, uh, her brief basically, uh, in my position opinion overstated the amount of similarity that was required between the two crimes um, because the theory with regard to Miss Willis in particular is a theory of knowledge and intent. The similarity is not as uh, necessary for the probative value to be there. The, the, it's not a theory of modus operandi where we need to show a very uh, striking similarity between the two crimes for the theory of relevance to make sense and not be a propensity uh, with regard to Miss Willis in particular. The theory is a theory of intent. So just this, the simple fact that uh, she had knowledge based on the Macomb County case that um, Mr. Crump was more likely than the average person, let's say, to commit a robbery murder like the, like the crime that was committed in both cases. Therefore, that I, I think uh, bears on her intent and knowledge uh, and not just her propensity. So um, if, if the court has no further questions, I'll rest on my brief. All right, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> Mr. Simon. Again, Jonathan Simon, P35596, <clears throat> this time for appellee, Mr. Crump. I think maybe there is such a thing as two separate acts being too similar. And, and it seems to me that when that occurs, there's a danger of whether or not the prosecutor argues propensity that it's going to be the natural conclusion on behalf of the jury. And notwithstanding any limiting instruction, when there is testimony of virtually identical incident happening in another forum uh, on another occasion, it, it's going to be viewed as propensity. And in, in that case, I believe that it should not be allowed under 404B because I don't believe that the limiting instruction would cure the prejudice. I, I think that due to the substantial similarity, the um, probative value is um, substantially outweighed by the prejudicial effect. The videotape's gonna be, it's gonna hurt no matter what anyway, from the crime. Oh, in Wayne County, yeah. I, <laughs> right. I, I mean, it's crystal clear. It's a, you know, usually you don't get videos that are as clear as this one. I mean, the, the usually they're gas station ones that are blurry or, or whatever. This is clear as to the whole whole crime. Then, then why do we need the Macomb County case? <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Thank you, Judge. We have Miss... Um, Okay, and both cases are submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Item <clears throat> number 10, docket number 365843, People versus Adji. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please this honorable court, Alexandria Taylor on behalf of Jermaine Agee. Use this time to respond to the prosecution's brief. In their argument, they state that in the transcript, um, my client's trial counsel stipulated to the weight, um, but that is actually incorrect. Um, the transcript specifically states that the stipulation was the chain of custody only. And then second, uh, with respect to maintaining a drug house, the, the case cited by the people, People v. Thompson, 477 Mish 145, that case has some language that quite frankly does not support their position. Uh, that specific case dealt with maintaining a drug car and the Supreme Court quoted this court stating that the prosecution did not present evidence that defendant exercised control or authority over the white van for an appreciable period of time for the purpose of making the van available for selling or keeping drugs. And so juxtaposed to what we have here in this matter, 
as the court knows from the brief submitted that there was some surveillance prior to the raid and that surveillance saw my client in the vicinity of the home. Uh, but when the officers were questioned on the stand, there was no testimony that my client was seen using a key to open the door or anything which would have suggested that he exercised some sort of degree of control over those premises. Um, more importantly, when the raid was conducted, my client was found to be seated on a couch in the living room with two other individuals. It was confirmed through testimony at trial that those two other individuals actually resided in that home, whereas my client did not. Uh, th this case was puzzling to me on so many levels, how it even made it to trial, quite, quite frankly. Um, but especially with this specific count, the lack of a nexus between my client and this home and the testimony. The testimony that um, by the officer who was doing the surveillance that the only person he saw doing the hand-to-hand -hand transactions uh, was your client, the only one. Right, so there was that they testimony. Said, well, that's a significant connection to the house and what was occurring uh, inside and outside the house. I do believe, Your Honor, that's questionable, respectfully. Uh, so my client is seen in the vicinity of this home. Well, these in the vicinity, in the front door, handing out uh, things to people who come up, and there's a quick transaction, and they leave. And the testimony from the officer is that he there was no specifics as far as what he saw. So there were no, never any specific drugs saw or money exchanged. Well, but went, these well, once they went in the house, there were the drugs. doesn't take a whole lot to make a connection. Arguably, Your Honor, um, but looking at the case law from specifically from this court and looking at what is sufficient for that nexus here, uh, that's simply not enough. Again, when you're looking at degree of control and especially in light of the fact that you have two individuals that readily admit that they reside there, whereas my client uh, did not. And, and that's un undisputed here. Anything else or nothing else? Okay. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate your time and your brief. Likewise. And the case is submitted. Thank you. Item number 11, docket number 366854, uh, Barrage versus Giles. Morning. Morning, Your Honors. Mm -hmm. Daniel Feinberg on behalf of the appellant. All right, you can proceed. Uh, thank you. Well, I believe this is a very straightforward case. Um, it, it's the purchase of a unit in a co-op, or actually the purchase of shares for the right to occupy a unit in a co-op is covered under the uh, Sellers Disclosure Act. Uh, the, the, the seller in this case, uh, Mr. Giles filled out the seller disclosure statement, indicated in response to the question, was there any work done without permits or without licensed uh, contractors? He answered, no, that in fact was false, or at least there's plenty of evidence that that was false. There were no permits issued, or we've located no permits issued by the city of Detroit. There's no certificate of occupancy has been issued. And from what we've been able to discern from the state website, the contractors were not licensed. That is a material representation. He had the option under the form of checking unknown, if that in fact was the case, he didn't do that. That would have set off all kinds of red flags for uh, my clients to have conducted further investigation, but they had no obligation to. Law doesn't impose them an obligation on them to conduct further investigation. Um, I think it's that simple. Um, I'll rely on my, my brief. Did they have the house or the unit inspected before they purchased? They did have the unit inspected. Um, it's typical. Well, in, in the case of a co-op, the co-op actually continues to be owns and it continues to be, well, they own the entire unit, but they continue to be responsible for the exterior. So the, the inspection is just a walls in interior inspection. And it noted some minor defects, but nothing to set off any red red flags. And there was no way an inspector could confirm through a walls-in inspection whether or not the work had been properly done or permits had been 
pulled or if licensed contractors had been used. Is it, uh, you know, is that the industry standard, I guess, uh, you know, real estate standard when you're buying a co-op, you just do a walls in, you don't take a look at the infrastructure? Well, yes, Your Honor. I mean, the only way you can take a look at the in infrastructure is actually to do some destructive work. And, and you know, they're certainly yeah, not, not a building inspector. No, I, I, I understand that. But you can't, you have to go inside the drywall to, to make those determinations. And that simply isn't done. You can't go into somebody's house and start um, <laughs> poking holes in the walls. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You have plenty of time for rebuttal. Good morning, Ryan Hill on behalf of Mr. Giles. Um, I'm going to rely on my brief, just touch on a couple of things. Uh, the very first thing is there's a FOIA request made to the city of Detroit, in, including the appellant's brief. In the actual language of the, the FOIA, and I, I read this the other day, it says, request is for records pertaining to 2088 Hyde Park from 2010 to present. We're talking about a particular unit. There's one document submitted from Building and Safety about an inspection report. So I, I'm a bit confused because it's unit 28 or 2088. I think that there's an issue with the actual FOIA request submitted. Um, as it relates to the damages, and I'm hoping the panel so, kind of realizes this, is this, is that even in the plaintiff's deposition testimony, they don't really have damages yet. They haven't opened up the walls. Um, the biggest issue the appellant has, and I, I've said this from day one, is obviously it's timing. At the time that Judge Giles actually signed or signed the purchase agreement, and signed the disclosure, which is not a warranty. It doesn't say a warranty. It says you get your own inspection. The plaintiff clearly said, I want another inspection. There was concessions made. At the time of that actual purchase agreement, he signed an affidavit, which was part of our motion, that at the time there was no known defects. And I think that that's two years after the fact, a 2021 inspection, now there's leaking pipes. They can't correlate there was some type of fraud or concealment on Judge Giles's part at the time he signed the PA. I, well, I just, what, what about what counsel just said about the, the disclosure statement where he, Mr. Giles said, uh, everyone, was, you know, we had a permit and everyone was licensed. And when he was deposed, uh, he said, I, I, I don't know. I don't remember seeing a permit. And, and I, I, I don't know if they were all licensed. Very selective in, in, in the excerpts of the deposition testimony, and I put that in my response. Um, he also put that all, all the repairs were made with board approval. What he said was structural and cosmetic, they were submitted with bonded papers, licenses to the board. Basically, the way this works, and I didn't know this about um, these, these co-ops, is the contractor gives the quotes or goes to the actual manager of the actual co-op, presents the quotes, licensing, bonding. The board makes a determination on whether or not they're going to approve it or not. If you read Judge Giles' testimony, he actually says the board approved the submission and he actually makes reference to plumbers and certain contractors he was aware had licenses and pulled permits, but he can't, he wasn't lying. After five years, he didn't say, did I see permits? No, because he hired a contractor who indicated to him he was licensed. He said that in his deposition testimony that the contractor said he was licensed, right? So, and then if you look at actual the plaintiff's testimony, he agreed in his deposition testimony or deposition. And I wasn't present for that. We participated just presenting my client because obviously we we're out of the case. But the plaintiff's testimony says that he agrees it was as is, and he admits that currently he has zero proof. He says that in his deposition testimony that we know we have issues, right? This is two years after the fact. And I think that the court, although the first order from the circuit court was as is, I think the, the court corrected it with a detailed opinion as it relates to the motion for reconsideration. Um, so I think for those reasons, I think that the ruling should stand. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you. Any rebuttal? Okay, thank you both. All right, that case is submitted. <clears throat> Item number 12, docket number 363-233, Locklear versus Oakland Schools. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Excellent, thank Good. you. Beth Whitman appearing on behalf of the plaintiff. Um, I, I know you have all read the briefs. I know you're very familiar with the issues. I just want to address just maybe two, three really quick points um, just in response to the 
um, defendant's brief. Uh, the obviously the position of the plaintiff is that there's a question of fact with respect to all three of the claims that we brought with respect to just cause the um, worker, or I'm sorry, the Whistleblowers Protection Act and the Elliot Larson Act claim. Um, with respect to the just cause claim for termination of the contract, the defendant ignores critical facts and contends that the plaintiff worked in his office on October 12th of 2020 and had, had COVID symptoms at that time. And then he had contacts with the staff members and um, lied to the contact tracer at the Oakland County Health Department with respect to this. But that ignores the plaintiff's deposition testimony where he said he did not actually have any COVID symptoms that day while he was at work. Yeah, but what about, the, yeah. <laughs> what about the, e the, the text messages where he tells his family Hey, I didn't, I didn't rat you out to the health department. And then I think it was his wife chimes in and says, well, yeah, but you were hanging out with all of us. I mean, th that shows he, fl he flat out lied. Well, he did say in his deposition testimony that he does not recall whether or not the contact tracer that he spoke with actually said 48 hours. So he did say, I didn't have any contact with anyone other than close contact oh, okay. with anyone other than my wife. But he still in the, in the text messages I, states... I did not give your names up, though I know I should have. I understand. I mean, I understand. Did, does that lack of recall create a factual issue? I don't, I, I think so. I think that the fact that he indicates that he doesn't recall whether she asked him specifically with respect to 48 hours, um, you know, because again, it was drilled into all of us during COVID, you know, close contact is someone who is six feet apart for a cumulative amount of 15 minutes over a 24 hour period. Reading this stuff gave me a nightmare. I know, was, I know, ugh. right? And, um, you know, working in the office, if yes. you had somebody who come, came into your office, you had to, you know, make right. sure that you stayed far apart. You know, I it was- saying they just pulled six feet out of the air. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, you know, so there is, my point, it just is, his testimony is that he did not have COVID symptoms at that time. You know, he was the one that was concerned about COVID. He was the one that brought up, you know, his concerns about COVID and we should be going remote. You know, so I, I just, I think that the testimony is there that creates at least a question of fact with respect to- um, Isn't there some testimony cause. too about he and a few others in the office were using, they weren't using what the school district wanted them to use for checking in every day and they right. were using some other. Yeah, that was the initial reason why they why they put him on leave was because of this app and that was out that there. Exactly, and that there they didn't find any reason to terminate based upon that. Um, it, so, with respect to uh, the other the other issue too, you know, with, it, with respect to the the lies is the the email correspondence that came from somebody else at the Oakland County health department who indicated that you know, um, my client in, it said to them that he was in his office all day and didn't have any contact with anyone. Well, we, that's not actually the contact tracer that he spoke with. Um, we don't know where that person got that information from. Um, it, the statement isn't in the case report from the actual intern that he spoke with at the Oakland County Health Department. So it, it's not clear, at least that doesn't establish that he in fact lied to the Oakland County Health Department. Um, then just very briefly with respect to the Whistleblowers Protection Act, the defendant makes the statement in their response brief that the plaintiff waived any argument that he engaged in protected, protected activity. And I just wanted to point out that in the response to the motion for summary disposition at pages one and 16, the plaintiff outlined how the COVID outbreak occurred and how it ultimately ended up in resulting in the, um, the decision to, um, I think, go remote eventually after a bunch of people had come down with COVID and how he had indicated his concerns about the school's failure to comply with these COVID rules. And he also, the plaintiff below. Uh, okay. He didn't really, I mean, his deposition testimony, I'm looking at it right here, he admitted he didn't raise any I don't know, maybe you don't need to, but he didn't say rules or regulations. He just came in and complained. Yeah. HR. Yeah. And he said, you know, we're supposed to, you know, there's a, there's, 
I think at that point there were must, you know, certain people must be remote and other ones were may. And, you know, he was dealing with a front, they call it the, the front department or the high department. And they were all remote. And then there's these group of people that are actually in person. And it was his position that everybody should have been remote. Yeah, but that's that not point. really a whistleblower thing. That's just a complaint that, that, you know what, I don't think this is, we're doing this right. But I he mean, did say, you know, it, the Whistleblower Protection Act covers where you're, you're making statements about rules, regulations. You know, he's, he's saying these are, these are mandates that we have that we're dealing with and that we're not complying with. But I just wanted to make the point that this wasn't waived. This was raised in his response to the motion for summary disposition. So unless the court has any questions for me, I would be happy to rely on my brief. Okay. For now. okay thank you. Any time for a bottle. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you? Good morning. May it please the court. David Welcome Porter. Back, Mr. Porter. Thank you. Thank you for having me. With me at council table is Elizabeth Hardy. Um, I'm happy to honor, did you? <laughs> <laughs> we know you didn't. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to answer any questions the court may have, but I will just jump into the breach of contract claim because it seems like that's where the dispute is here. Uh, just as a friendly reminder, Oakland Schools terminated his one year employment contract because of a false statement he made to the Oakland, Health, Oakland County Health Department, which was that he was in his office all day and therefore had no client close contacts to report. That came from an email notification from Kaylee Blaney, the ep epidemiologist that he spoke to, uh, and it caused Oakland schools to not do any follow-up mitigation efforts and then therefore affected the health and safety of Oakland schools employees. The trial court correctly dismissed this claim for three reasons. One, there's no question of what he said to the contract tracer. There's no question that that was a lie. And there's no question that that lie constitutes just cause. Uh, before I get into that, let me just clarify that the lie was not, was he having symptoms while he was at work? That was not the basis for the board's decision. That's clear from exhibit T, that's the, the board member's affidavits. Uh, it, it's also not whether or not he breached any COVID protocols. Um, that was an issue, that was a concern. It's what uh, initially prompted the investigation. But what ultimately drove the termination decision was his lie to the contract tracer. And as you pointed out, it was intentional. Uh, he knew what he was doing. Uh, because he texted his family member right afterwards and said, don't worry, I didn't say you. I mean, it, it, that wasn't known at the time of the, the termination decision, but Oakland Schools isn't allowed to rely on evidence that it's uncovered afterwards that corroborates the decision that this was, in fact, a lie, and it does constitute just cause. Mr. Mr. Lockler has already admitted that he was traveling around the building that day. So there's no question that it was false that he said that he was in his office all day. He also does not recall any portion of his communication with the epidemiologist. So as Judge Reardon pointed out, it's the absence of evidence against evidence in the record from Ms. Kaylee Blaney that this is what he said. And he's she's paraphrasing or quoting what he says unlike the contact tracer report, which was uncovered after uh, he was terminated, which basically is their bottom line conclusion about the, the, the question that they're reaching out at uh, about, which is, does he have any close contacts? Do we as the health department need to follow up with anybody? Uh, so there's no really real inconsistency between those two records and nothing from Mr. Locklear that disputes it because he testified under oath that he can't recall. And uh, just one last point, they've never argued that this does not constitute just cause, it clearly does. He was the Dean of one of these technical campuses. Oakland schools looked to him to enforce and abide by these COVID protocols. And he clearly did it in this instance. So unless the court has any other questions, I'm happy to rely on my brief for the rest of the questions. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you for both doing a good job because I told my two interns who were here that you both were top-notch lawyers and you should pay attention. So hopefully they did. Yeah. You said that about Mr. Porter? Or yeah, Mr. Hardy? both. Oh, okay. I, didn't, I didn't know which one was going to jump up there, but I know they're both good and Obviously, this is the first is. time I've had Mr. Porter. He's top notch. So. Yeah, <laughs> I knew yeah. his work here was top notch. So. Yeah. All right. Well, have uh, good much. to see you. Good to see all of you, and have a good rest of the day. Take care. Case is submitted. What time is it? Ten fifty-six. Oh, thirty-six. Whoa. Well, want to go vote on stuff and Whatever you want might to as do. well do it until someone gets here and just let us know whenever anybody gets here. You're our leader. All right. Let's do it then. All right. <clears throat>
All right. Um, item number 14, docket number 367473, Inray Valentin Leonard Miners. Uh, we have a waiver. Yep. Okay. So we'll, that's submitted on the briefs. Which brings us to the last case already. How efficient are we? Um, 362, item 15, 362, 531, people versus picket. I'd like to say the litigants are being yes. better than we are. We can't take They're getting right to the it. point. Yeah. Dealing with the case. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Abrielle Neely from the State Appellate Defender Office on behalf of Mr. Jimmy Pickett. Okay. Mr. Pickett was denied the effective assistance of counsel in as high stakes of a case as you can get in Michigan. Mr. Pickett's jury was faced with a choice between second degree murder and voluntary manslaughter. And the jury was not properly instructed on the elements of murder. Trial counsel performed efficiently in failing to request a Mulaney instruction. The general voluntary manslaughter instruction was not enough here. The Mulaney instruction would have informed the jury that it was the state's burden to prove malice beyond a reasonable doubt. To obtain a conviction for murder, where the defense has presented evidence for voluntary manslaughter, it is the state's burden to prove the element of malice beyond a reasonable doubt. And proving that there is malice requires disproving heat of passion and provocation. So while heat of passion and provocation are not elements, they vitiate the element of malice. Mulaney explains that in order to prove malice, the state must disprove both heat of passion and provocation. Trial counsel was deficient here because he did not provide that necessary instruction to the jury. Now, Mulaney is not a Michigan case, but it is a United Supreme Court's case that is directly on point and binding. A cursory search on Westlaw and this case would have popped up. Um, trial counsel's deficient performance prejudiced Mr. Pickett. He hadn't requested the Mulaney instruction. The jury would have heard that the prosecutor's burden was there and would have held the jury, uh, would have held the prosecutor to uh, that beyond a reasonable standard, uh, beyond a reasonable doubt standard. There is a reasonable probability that the outcome would have been different. Bashar had rented a room, arranged for Mr. Pickett to be brought to the motel and he had um, paid Mr. Pickett for sexual favors. After hours of engaging in sex acts, Mr. Pickett needed to leave. And Bashar was not yet finished, so he became violent. Mr. Pickett wanted to leave. Um, and this was the heat of passion that the state did not disprove. A properly instructed jury could have concluded that the state was not held to its burden. And in People v. Hoffmeister, although this was, and Mr. Pickett acted in an emotional disturbance, um, People v. Hoffmeister says that the brutali brutality of a killing does not itself justify an inference of malice. Uh, for this reason, Mr. Pickett is entitled to a new trial. And I'd like to talk about my second issue. The court impermissibly factored race into the sentencing process by considering the racist remarks made by Bashar's family. During sentencing, Mr. Pickett was called a deranged animal, a monster, and inhumane. None of which has anything to do with race. It has to do with the brutal acts that he committed on their relative that caused his death. Had nothing to do with it. And I think, didn't the trial court say, I didn't rely on anything that the victim's, victim's family said anyway? So I'd like to address that in two parts. So first... Make sure you address it correctly yes. because this is, you're treading down a path that there's no support for. So Mr. Pickett is a black man in America and he was called an animal. Black an men animal have been- for killing a man with blunt force trauma repeatedly. Yes. Not because of his skin color, but for what he did and the family members were there expressing emotion, right? Yes, absolutely. Not and race. They were and then, entitled... by the way, the case, most of the cases you cite are employment cases. They have nothing to do with sentencing. So let me, so I'll, first I'll address your first two issues. Um, so first, Mr. Pickett 
is entitled to a sentencing that is free from any kind of racist remarks. So although the trial judge did not make any racist statements and you may not- The, the, the victim's family members. The victim's you're family- You're still gonna argue that it was. The victim's family played upon a long history that we have in the United States of racial prejudice against black people. Black people have been likened to animals since the beginning of the that, slave was trade. Was that down south or up in the north? I mean, if you're gonna get it back into the history of things. Council, I don't know if you're new at Sato, but just be careful about how you argue. You're not gonna win on this argument. There's no legal support for it. There's no factual support for it. And it's us all hyperbole is what it is. I understand that that is your perspective, and I appreciate it's that. It's the law's perspective. However, we cannot ignore a history of Black men being called super predators, of Black men being called monsters. And I, I, think, you've gone and, far, I think you've gone far afield on this one. I'd I move I, on to your next issue. And by the way, the this, this white defendants who do the same horrible things are called the same thing. And animals, super predators. It's because of the actions, not because of the person's skin color. So On your next argument, if you have another. That was my last issue. Um, Is there any indication in the record that the trial court understood those to be references to race? No, there's, there's nothing in the record. There's nothing in the record. However, we all have racial biases and these biases, no, I, I, we're not we here hear. To, we're not here to argue sociological issues. I mean, those are really deep seated sociological issues that we all have different perspectives on because we all come from different places. All right. I'm an Irish Catholic. You're obviously, you know, I don't know. You might be Irish Catholic too. I don't know. Um, but we all come from different places. There's no question. We're bound by the record. Yes. That's what we have to look to. We can't be going outside the record and trying to correct our society's ills on a case where we don't. There, there's simply nothing in there that's referencing that the court relied on race or anything of that nature, or that, that those comments permeated any decisions <sighs> made by the court. So like my um, colleagues or my brothers uh, on the bench are saying, I think it's best if you move on. <coughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, Deborah Blair, on behalf of the people, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, the appellee in this matter, the defendant has raised three issues in his brief on appeal. The first issue is ineffective assistance of counsel regarding the definition of manslaughter and the jury instructions. <laughs> Uh, the people believe that Patterson versus New York sufficiently covers this particular subject, and there was no ineffective assistance of counsel. The trial jury was um, properly instructed on all the elements of the crime and found that the defendant was guilty of second degree murder. Um, the second and third issues deal with sentencing. Um, I just want to touch on the idea of the acquitted conduct issue. The defendant makes the argument that because the judge said that he considered all the facts and evidence of the trial, that he was therefore relying on acquitted conduct and fashioning within <laughs> guideline sentence for second degree murder. I find that to be a ridiculous proposition. The judge clearly did not rely on acquitted conduct and there's nothing in the record to support that he did. So for all those reasons, uh, we ask that you affirm the defendant's conviction and sentence. Okay. All right. Thank you. So the state cites Patterson. Um, however, Patterson only applies to affirmative defenses, which voluntary manslaughter is not. So Patterson is not the case on point here. Um, Mulaney was the proper um, instruction that um, trial counsel should have requested. And for those reasons, there was an ineffective assistance of counsel. Thank you. I'm, you know, you, you do you, you do a very fine job presenting your, your argument. I know you got to make the argument that you have to on behalf of your client. Um, it, it's just that, um, you know, what you got to read the, 
the panel a little bit. I'm sure Mr. Monahan will tell you about that. Um, and, and, you know, we focus on the law and we focus on the facts. And even if you think that it's a, it's a good faith effort argument to expand things, I mean, there's only so much. So I don't want you to think just because we had a little bit of heated exchange that you didn't do a good job. You did a very nice job on behalf of your client. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That case is submitted. And um, that's it for today. Our case call. We're, we're, all, we're all finished. Huh? All right. All right.